face of the pandemic. I extend a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Dr. Jayakar Vedamanikam, Senior Fellow at the Peninsula Foundation. And I would also like to welcome other distinguished experts and participants in the audience. The event will be moderated by Air Marshal Madheshwaran, President of the Peninsula Foundation. This lecture is a timely one since despite the virus's continuous mutation and death forms, people have become desensitized to the consequences of I mean, infection transmission and ignored the unseen deaths. Dr. Jack has written an issue brief on the same topic, which is published on the DPF website for those who would like to know more. And I hope you enjoy this interesting and important lecture. Please, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box or raise your hand during the introduction session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madhavanti. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jayakar Vedamanikam, who also happens to be my school classmate. Uh, he's had a very industrious career as an aeronautical engineer uh, with a background from uh, either alumni of the RDC Trichy, and he's done his PhD from IIT Mumbai as well. Uh, he's headed the aerospace uh, vertical in uh, HAL Bangalore. And thereafter, I think he was CEO of IRAL, the Indo-Russian uh, joint venture in Nasik. Uh, he's, uh, after retirement, he's moved on to, you know, looking at behavioral economics. And uh, immediately after retirement, he was director of the Xavier Institute of Management in Bangalore. And uh, thereafter, he's now got on to, uh, you know, writing books as well as uh, uh, getting deeper into the aspect of behavioral economics. Uh, today's uh, topic is very interesting. And uh, for all of us, we know that the pandemic has uh, changed our, our lives really upside down over the last three years, almost two and a half years. And uh, we are still hoping now that the end of this, uh, you know, uh, virus is uh, somewhat in sight, hopefully. Uh, going back into history, I think the Spanish flu uh, in 1918, uh, uh, 2021 went through uh, similar, created similar havoc across the world. By some estimates, uh, nearly 100 million people died. A conservative estimate was more than 50 million people died. In India, which was under the British at that time, and the health services were, uh, I would say, compared to today, is primitive. Uh, we lost 17 million people, which is the official count. And uh, so pandemics tend to come in, you know, the virus comes in and uh, uh, the, in various phases. The second phase tends to be the killer phase, which actually, you know, creates havoc. And that's exactly what happened in the Spanish flu time as well. We saw that last year. And, uh, you, you know, uh, the pandemics have existed in human history throughout. And there are lots of data that's available. So what Jacobs will be covering in this is to look at today's data tools and, and uh, statistical methods that are available to actually analyze how the infections can spread and therefore be more cautious. And the health departments can take those preventive actions to reduce the kind of you know, fatalities as well as infection spreading. Last year, we one of the most contributive factors were the coinciding with the election time, we are having elections now as well. But last year, the second phase was on, and which is which I said as earlier is a killer phase, and we had massive, you know, electoral uh, election meetings, which I think contributed in a big way to the spread of the disease, including events like major, you know, events like Kumbh Mela, etc. So, uh, 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 Dr. Jaika will cover these aspects and explain through the statistical process how we could have been actually, we could have been better. The idea is to learn from history and, and thousands of years of pandemic data is still available. But nevertheless, you know, all nations, not just in India, most nations have uh, actually uh, failed to deal with it effectively. And that's a lesson that probably which he will bring out quite um, clearly in this talk. Without taking any more time, let me hand over to uh, Dr. Jekka Vedamanikam, Jekka Olyos. Thank you, Marshal Mateshwaran, for that wonderful introduction. 
of both me and the subject. And uh, as I speak, I'm going to certainly keep it as simple as possible because complicated statistics is complicated for me as well. And uh, so I am I'm presenting it from almost somebody uh, who has only a basic knowledge of school mathematics in order to arrive at uh, fairly far-reaching conclusions. So I will go on to share my screen and uh, delve straight away into the subject. As Emma Shell Vartaman mentioned, the subject topic looks very complicated infection, transmission, footprint, uh, behavioral economics, nudge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I will basically introduce the subject of behavioral economics and nudge, which are not very familiar terms, though each of them have a very far-reaching implication in, in, the, in, in uh, doing this. So what I will do is after introducing, I will introduce another point, which is uh, VCRT, W-Y-S-I-A-T-I, -I, um, which stands is an acronym for what you see is all there is. And uh, as um, uh, M. Marshall Mathishwaran mentioned, uh, over history, over thousands of years, we have not learned some aspects because of this phenomenon, which has recently been put forward. So I will, of course, introduce the infection transmission footprint and principles for estimating this. Fundamental principles, simple principles, and computation, as I mentioned, will be very, very simple, some multiplications and divisions, nothing more than that. And uh, we will also compute the ITF, which stands for Infection Transmission Footprint, for a mass gathering event, such as an election rally. And then we will relate all this ITF to the consequences and why this metric could be important for steering policy. Now, when we say behavioral economics, we need to introduce two Stalwarts, the founding fathers of uh, uh, economics, one is Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Daniel Kahneman would go on to receive a Nobel Prize in economics, although he is actually a cognitive scientist. And um, I will introduce the subject with one experiment which they did called the anchoring experiment. Um, it almost takes me back to the college days when we play pranks. And this experiment which they did seems to me like a practical joke which they carried out. What they did was uh, they got a, a, a fortune, a wheel of fortune. It's like a roulette wheel but it goes uh, in like a giant wheel, a small uh, um, wheel of fortune, which has numbers between five, uh, zero and 100 in steps of five. And they rig this to stop either at number 15 or number 10 or number 65. So either it will stop at 10 or number 65. So they call their subjects, so after the wheel of fortune was uh, revolved and it stopped at, at a, according to them a random number, they said, write down that number on a piece of paper. So they wrote it down. Next, they asked a very odd question. They said, tell us, is this number smaller or greater than the percentage of African nationals in the United Nations, the percentage of African nation, uh, 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 nation countries in the United Nations, is this number small or big, uh, greater or smaller? So each of them gave an answer. 
And uh, then they said, next, the third task is write down your best estimate of the number of African nations uh, or the percentage of African nations in the United States. Now, they took, collected this data over mm, several numbers of people and they analyzed it. Now, what showed up was that those who had got the number 10 and then they had written down that number, with that, the, the, uh, uh, their estimate, and those who had got that number 65 and they had written their estimate, was grossly different. The average of those who had written the uh, who had written the random number ten, their estimate was twenty five percent. Whereas those who had got the random number of sixty five, their estimate was forty five percent. Now this is what is anchoring. That means a number that was given triggered their judgment of what the, 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 the percentage of African nations in the United Nations would be. Now, the phenomenon of anchoring was not known prior, uh, I mean, was well known prior to this. But what is important here is that in spite of knowing that the number that they have is a random number, which was generated by the fortune wheel. And uh, they seem to have put their estimate based on that. Now, this is what is behavioral economics is all about, where, uh, I will skip this for want of time, uh, is about the perplexing behavior of people where they know or are capable of knowing what is right or good for them but choose to behave in a way that is not right or good for them. The, the whole behavioral economics centers around this fact of knowing uh, uh, this. Uh, I had put a bat and a ball right next. If uh, you would, um, uh, 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 this is another question. If you wish to score a point over somebody else, you could ask them a question. A bat and a ball cost 110 rupees. If the bat costs 100 rupees more than that of the ball, what is the cost of the ball? Now, this experiment has been done all around the world, and 80% of the people give a wrong answer. They say that the uh, ball costs 10 rupees while it actually costs five rupees. But post the same problem, in mathematical terms of X and Y, every one of them solves it, virtually. X plus Y equals 110, and X minus Y is 100. Uh, uh, they all come up with the right answer that Y is five. Um, now, this is where the, 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 the perplexing behavior of they know what is right, but they don't know do what is right. Um, this is what another stalwart defines it as uh, the difference between what people should do and what they actually do. Okay, this is the prospect theory, which we will not delve into it, for which uh, Daniel Kahneman was awarded the Nobel Prize, which altered the fundamental theory of the, uh, uh, um, the aspect of uh, Dan, what Daniel Bernoulli created of the theory of marginal utility. Um, and uh, by what, whatever he had found, and of course the Nobel Prize went to him. But Daniel Kahneman brought out a book which is based on 40 years of experiment, behavioral experiments called Thinking Fast and Slow, where he distinguishes two types of thinking that all of us engage in. The uh, um, a thinking which is fast, quick, spontaneous, 
and the other type of thinking which is slow deliberate and logical and uh, so on so a good portion of psychology the behaviors which have been observed are explainable by these methods and that's how the behavioral economics comes and one of the biases which he says is the viciati what you see is all there is any information which is relevant but is not in front of you does not matter that is the way and he says uh, a quote from him they didn't want more information that might spoil their story we all make our own stories now uh, okay richard thaler he also received the nobel prize for uh, economics more recently about 5 4 5 years back his phd thesis was on putting a dollar value on saving a human life so behavioral economics he is a behavioral economics and sometimes he is called the father of behavioral economics and uh, it it he it focuses on the attempt of measurement and therefore measurement is a, is a key to behavioral economics because our system one thinking does not translate reality and yet we need to take decisions and that is why uh, the uh, he co-wrote a book along with uh, cass sunstein who is a, a constitutional lawyer and a harvard professor in uh, the us um, they formulated uh, 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 um, the philosophy of libertarian paternalism that means you give choice to the people but don't force them that's why it is uh, libertarian by the a method called nudge the title of the book they published is nudge that one of the excellent examples of nudge is making an automatic enrollment suppose for a saving scheme by default if you have to enroll a certain amount then you are nudging them if they have to change it then they would need to uh, uh, um, change the idea of uh, they'll have to make an effort example if uh, the 8% savings through pf a contribution to pf is mandatory normally we all save that way at least till i was in service that was the order but then much later i realized it is far better for me to have put uh, 16% or 20% now if the automatic nudge would be when the person first signs the forms and puts it the automatic is 20% and then if you wish to change make you are you have the freedom to change you facilitate better decisions for individual society and the world of course this behavioral economics has been taken seriously and uh, during the obama administration and similarly in the uk they formed various teams and a lot of contribution has come to society through these experiments um okay i will skip this because we are we will not have time to do the more important parts okay my story comes from a personal incident as to why i'm thinking in terms of the uh, the infection transmission footprint last year in summer we always we frequent a place called uh, new frosties which is a, a cold storage from where we buy meat and very spacious place large uh, cold storage and uh, one day when we visited after the the rules were relaxed we found there used to be a couple also there who sell vegetables and fruits then the owner of the store told me they passed away so this kabir and hasina very lively couple 
uh, 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 selling their wares, with sometimes their children also helping them out. And uh, we were surprised. And of course, they were the victims. But later, when the next day, my wife had made a sumptuous meal followed by a dessert of apple custard. I was wondering, now, when I eat an apple, the it has come from Shimla all the way. Several service providers like Hasina have been involved in the process of delivering the service. And I don't know how many people had got infected in the process of the whole transmission, the value chain of the service which I receive. And this raised a question, is there a way to evaluate how many lives are compromised due to corona in the production of a good or a service which we enjoy? All of us uh, um, uh, enjoy all the services, so is there a way? Of course, during that period, there have also been election rallies and uh, don't worry, it's not a graphic picture. Those people who are lying down are not dead bodies, but they are actually people protesting that the election rallies are stopped. Uh, on April 7th uh, of 2021, when the, the, we were having a raging um, corona wave. So these things put Another question, and also simultaneously, uh, the Madras High Court made a remark to the Election Commission on seeing the uncontrolled election rallies, you should be put on murder charges. This was the remark. So in a way, is there a way to evaluate how many lives are compromised due to mass gathering events, such as the conduct of an election rally, Kumbh Mela, weddings, etc. So the metric expected number of inspections transmitted in the production of a good whatever, etc. because that is the key aspect. So um, when we produce a good or produce a service, how many infections have been transmitted? This count is critical because that is the cost as far as the corona is concerned about the, the uh, uh, extent of transmissions that take place. So the principles for com computing ITF, one is to estimate PI. Now this number P with the suffix is not very comfortable for most people, but it just means probability that an individual is infectious. I stands for being infectious because only if there is an infectious person can the, the um, uh, transmission take place. And another probability is PT, T standing for a transmission of an infection to another person. What is the probability that it will be, just because an uh, infected person is there, it doesn't mean that he will definitely transmit the infection. It's a probabilistic uh, situation. So example, if there are N members in a bubble for one hour, the ITF would be, to use a notation, ITF PP stand for people proximity, where there are N people and we spend one hour with, uh, uh, with, with the, um, uh, in the group. Then the number of transmis transmissions of the, that take place is N into N minus one, PI multiplied by PT. N into N minus one is not a very complicated thing. It's the number of possible uh, combinations one can have of two people in where there are N people. So it is eight people are there and each of them can combine with seven. So eight into seven, if it is eight, that's N into N minus one. Each of them 
Each combination has a probability of transmission. One of them can be infected and the transmission takes place, PI into PT. Now, additional estimate due to fomites. Fomites is material that carries an infection. Now, fortunately, we can almost ignore this. Now, the latest uh, 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 research shows that the transmission through fomites is relatively small compared to the transmission through aerosol and droplets. For, for mass gathering events, we have a simpler procedure, which will exactly give the same results, uh, but easy to understand. Now, consider a trucking service. From Shimla, your apples are being brought to Delhi, where there are uh, uh, the driver and his assistant are seated side by side in the cabin, comfortably closed in order not the, the cold chills of Shimla not hitting them. Now, how do we compute the, the, the um, uh, infection transmission footprint for that part of the service which goes into the, the apples coming from Shimla? During the peak, our um, figures were of 4 lakhs is the daily reporting uh, of number of new corona cases. Therefore, uh, but we will consider a value of 70,000 as the daily reporting rate. Suppose on the day when they are traveling, the uh, the uh, reported new cases in a day was 70,000. Now, number of infectious people would be three times that number. Why do I say that? Because people start infecting others even before they develop symptoms. In some of the studies, it says it is two days before the symptom. Some studies say three days so we take a value of three, that means if the daily reporting is at 70,000 infections a day, the number of infectious people are three times who are floating around in the country. This figure is still very, very conservative because there are also people who are asymptomatic who also contribute to the transmission of infections. So simple. So population of India is 1.4 billion. Therefore, an estimate of someone chosen at random, if the probability that he is infectious is 1.5 into 10 power minus 4. Or how do we get that? It is uh, 1.4 into 10 power minus nine is the population which we uh, uh, divide. The total number of infectious people, 21 into 10 power four divided by 1.4 into 10 power nine. A little mathematics, arithmetic will tell us it is 1.5 into 10 power minus four. What behavioral economics tells us is the moment we have such numbers, the mind doesn't connect at all. It, it just leaves it. And that is part of the reason why we have not had a proper metric till date. Now, ITF, that is the, for PPN is equal to two. That means the two people, the truck driver and his assistant traveling is two into PI into PT. Now this leaves one more figure of knowing PT. What is the possibility that the, uh, driver, if he was infected, he also infects his assistant as they travel for the whole day. It will take about nine hours to drive from Shimla to Delhi. And nine hours of staying together, we can almost be certain that the other person will be infected. We can take that as one, as an illustration here. So ITF, for one aspect of service we have found is 3 into 10 power minus 4. We can skip this. Now, factors affecting PT. Transmission, we said because here, but all services do not require 
a full day of uh, a person staying in proximity with another person. Therefore, the possibility of transmissions we find by the probability that an infectious person transmits the infections to another person depends on social distance, etc., but also depends on time spent in the bubble. So we resort to a simple curve, and uh, this is based on the Poisson arrival, a Poisson curve, uh, where on the x-axis you have time in hours, and in the y-axis the probability of a transmission taking place. Now, it's very clear that um, as the time increases, the risk of being uh, getting infected is more. But there are three curves. It, those factors depend on how serious, how well protected are they wearing a mask, how close they are, and the viral load of the person, and so on. And being random, there will always be all three aspects of that probability uh, uh, of all these three curves. Now, assuming, suppose you go to a, a hairdresser, you spend half an hour with him, we can well assume that it will be the red curve because you would be wearing your mask, he would be wearing his mask, and then the distance is okay. So if you spend half an hour, probably the risk of that transmission is only 0.2. Can you see on the red line, which is the bottommost line, and against 0.5, which is not marked, but it's halfway down one. And if we cut it on the y-axis, 0.2 corresponds to this. And of course, in different situations, it will be different. So if we had a one-person hairdressing done, um, you will have the, the infections transmitted, number of infections transmitted is a very small number, 0.6 into 10 power minus 4. Now, applying the same to the several people in a salon. Suppose you go to a big uh, hairdressing salon where there are four chairs and there are eight people, four service providers and four customers. Then, using the same approach, we have the figure 56 into 1.5 into 10. The 56 comes from n into n minus 1. That is 8 multiplied by 7 is 56. 1.5 into 10 minus 4 on the bottom line is refers to the, the probability that one of them is infectious. And 0.2 is the probability that the, an infection will be transmitted. And we divide by four because in order to, because here there are four people being served, therefore four units of the service is being delivered. So in order to compare with one service unit, we have, if we divide it, we need to divide the total expected number of infections transmitted by four, and you have a figure 4.2 into 10 minus four. Whereas in a one man, one barber salon, you had the value of 0.6 into 10 minus 4. Now, this is the first very important aspect which gets revealed by this computation. Though the numbers really don't make sense to us, we have a situation where for the same service that was derived, you have seven times more infections have been transmitted. In other words, a service rendered as a one-man saloon, he does a certain social good is in the product or service since the total number of transmissions that have taken place are seven times lower than what would be for a unit service received from a very large uh, um, 
um, salon with, which has four different uh, people working together. Um, now we will move on to the event because um, number of infections transmitted in an event depends on the number of infectious people in the crowd. So we already know that. So let us calculate how many people would be there in a large crowd and the probability of an infectious person, which is anyway the same. So let's take, we will take the same figures as daily reported cases being 70,000. Uh, again, as I said, the end was number of infections, infectious people in the country would be three times that number, 3N, which is uh, 2.1 into 10 power 5. That means all over the country you are having, at that point of time, you can expect 2.1 into 10 power 5 number of people who are infectious. If the population of India, we already computed that, we have, uh, uh, yeah, we have this computation already done, so we will not repeat it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, if we consider that uh, there are number attending an election rally is 10,000 people. Absolutely not uncommon. It was much more in most cases. Expected number of infectious people in the crowd would be 10, 10 power 4, which is the number of people in the crowd, multiplied by the probability that any one of them is infectious, which is 1.5 into 10 power minus 4, and that is 1.5. In other words, in an election rally held sometime in March or April last year, when the corona was raging, about 1.5 person, either one or two person is only expected to have been infectious. Just about one or two, which is a very small number. Uh, I'm sure th those who were pitching for that uh, 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 it's a fundamental right of democracy to do election campaigns will be very happy to read this figure. On the other hand, Mamta Banerjee, who was pitching, who had stopped election campaigns, if she is listening to this, would find, oh my, did I make a mistake? After all, this is it. But the story is not over. Expected number of infectious people in the crowd is 1.5, uh, but the number of people they infect is what is the infection transmissions that have taken place during an election. It is 1.5 into expected number one person infects. So this is the, a, a typical picture of an election rally. Um, no social campaigning. And then we again apply this, this graph. Here we can be fairly certain there would be a few people who are in the blue graph who are very close to them. And there would be few, few people of that infection person in just one of them in the crowd who will be at the green background and those who will be in the red curve. So if we model this, so we need to identify how many are so close that they are in the blue curve and how many are just close proximity who are in the each of them who are slightly far away and who are very near. So from all this, we can say that the number of people who are closest to the person will always be few. That's five. And then from very close to close, in, in striking range is about 10. And again, a few who are a little far away, but still within striking range is about 18. And then the rest, that person uh, uh, will not have an influence on infecting them. So there are about uh, 33 people where there is a chance of them getting infected. 
and each of them will have a different probability. The five person who are standing close, if we uh, extrapolated from the curves, they will have about 0.8 possibility of getting infected. Those who are a little close, but not very close, they will have a lesser probability of 0.7. And those who are a little near will be 0.5. And the well-distanced people will not be infected. So if we compute the expected number to be infected, we will we get a value of 20. 5 multiplied by 0.8 of all the 5 who are very close to him, maybe 4 will get infected, not all. Those who are fairly close, about 7 will be, get infected, not all 10. And those who are a little away, about 9 of them will get infected, but not all 18 who have been in the striking range. So the total expected number of infections would be 20. Now, the expected number of infectors in the crowd is 1.5. You don't know whether it is 1 or whether it is 2. Or it could be three people, off of them with a very light viral load, and so on. So the number of infections that are transmitted during the one and a half hours election rally per person is 20. Therefore, the total that is transmitted during the event is 30. That means 30 people have got infected during the one election rally, which has about 10,000 people. This again may still look comforting, and that is where the, the behavioral economics explanation of system one thinking and system two thinking is all about. Uh, this looks very comfortable because we don't see what we need to see. After all, for us, in such a major rally, just about 30 people got infected, while all over the country, lakhs of people are getting infected. This is a small number. But let's see, in order to see the effect, please stay on in case anybody is moving, because the, the uh, more important thing is coming with not very complicated. Another suffix you are seeing, R0. Um, don't worry about that. It is a basic reproduction number. All that it means is, on an average, an infected person, how many people does he infect? And for the corona, uh, it was of the order of five, R0. But then RT is that R doesn't remain at five all along. It actually starts coming down. And uh, therefore, RT is defined as the reproduction number after the onset of the disease, when immunity tends to set in, when people have already got infected, and so on. Uh, RT would be lower than zero. Now, for the Delta variant, R0 was 5.08. This is based on what is called a meta-analysis, where the study of 14 other databases who have studied, they're all aggregated and then put together. Um, okay, that's not of concern to us. Another parameter which is relevant is generation time. That means while he infects five people, after a generation time, time interval, it's the time interval that takes from moving from one infected person to the next. The, the, the figure is, uh, it's called the serial interval or the generation time. Uh, serial interval is the proxy for it because you know the he is infected from symptoms. So from one symptom of the primary person to the next is the time, next person, which is 5.4 or 5.2, it's a small number. So now we see the impact. We have uh, six columns. Column number one gives the days after the infection. That means after five days, we have taken generation time of five days. R0 was five, but we will not take five. Uh, days after the infection, say for instance, zero days after the election rally, 
let's say the effective reproduction rate was three. We have not taken the R0 of five. We have taken that hopefully by that time things have come down. Number infected is zero. He is not going to infect others during that, on the day he is infected. Cumulative number of infection zero, number dead zero, cumulative deaths zero. After five days, he would have infected three people. In the third column, you see that. Cumulative number of infections caused by that one person who got infected during the, corona, during the election rally is three. Number dead are zero, cumulative deaths zero. After 10 days, uh, the cumulative number of infections cost becomes 12 because he, those three whom he infected have in turn infected nine others because the effective reproduction rate is three. After 15 days, we are making a comfortable assumption that the effective reproduction rate has come down to two. Because actually the effective reproduction rate comes down to one when it reaches the peak. So this is much before the peak. Therefore, number infected is 18 because in the previous, uh, on the 10th day, about nine people were infected and each of them will infect two more people. So that makes it 18. So the cumulative number of infection is 12 plus 18, 30. So this goes on. On 20th day, you have similarly, with a reproduction number of two, you have 25th day, you have cumulative number of infections. And on the 30th day, Effective reproduction rate has come down to 1.5. Number infected is only 108 out of the 72 of the, 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 the secondary people who were infected. Uh, it is 108. And number dead is one. Now, where does that figure come? For the first time, you are having a number which is a non-zero in that column. The one person, because you have got so far, on day 20, there were already about 66 people infected. Now, the mortality rate, if we take at 2%, out of the 66, they wouldn't get die on the day they were infected, but after another 10 days, one of them would have died. Now, this story goes on. On the 35th day, you will find two people dying because Two weeks before that, 138 people were infected. So the cumulative deaths has now become three. So if we take on that way, uh, continuing it in the next slide, um, you are having uh, on the 45th day, we are seeing that the peak has been reached, which is if you model around that, if the election rally was uh, conducted in March, after 45 days in April, uh, uh, end was somewhere the peak. So you have got a situation of number infected 243. Effective reproduction number has come down to one. That means each of these 243 people will only infect one, one person in the next five days. So putting the same cumulative number of infections is 894, number dead is three, and the cumulative deaths have become eight. And it continues 50th day, 55th day, and on the 60th day, we say that the effective reproduction number has come down from one. That means they infect less people than the number who were infected. This takes us to cumulative deaths of 23 already of those who were infected. And when we come to the 90th, 85th day, by the time the effective reproduction number is tapered off, it has come down to 0.5, but the cumulative deaths of about 1,945 people, <coughs> excuse me, who had died, it would be 39 people would have died. All would not die. It's only 2% and that 2% has been, no one knows whether it's, it's the correct value, 
but it's the most conservative value which one can assume. So 40 people have died in the process of one person having got infected in the election rally. So now, how many infectors were there in the election rally? There were 30 people who were infected because of that event of an election rally. So now 30 people being infected and each of them has been the cause for the death of 40 people, which is, uh, if we multiply simple arithmetic, 1,200 people would have died as a consequence of one election rally conducted with about 10,000 people at a time when the daily testing rate was about 70,000. And uh, for each event, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be different, but it'll be something of that order. On the day when the prime minister had uh, 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 an election rally in Asansol on April 19th, the uh, number recorded as dead, uh, uh, as infected on that day was uh, uh, mm, uh, about three times that uh, 70,000. It was 2,34,000 people were recorded. And prior to that, there would have been less, but then we mustn't take that because at that time, the reproduction number would have been smaller. It wouldn't have been three. It is likely to have been maybe 1.5. Or, or so. So it is not necessarily that it leads to that unless we make this calculation. This is higher, the 1,200 people dying is twice the number of deaths which were caused at the Jallianwala Bagh massacre by Reginald Dyer. Now do we see that? Now that is what Viziati, which is a behavioral economics principal insight, what you see is all there is. As far as the consequence is concerned, it is the same. It is double that of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, where about 600 people perhaps uh, 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 were dead. There are various estimates again, but a more realistic estimate would be of that order. Uh, so what you see is all there is. And the talk today is an attempt to bring out what you do not see, but is very relevant for the policies. You well, this was the remark made by the uh, High Court to the Election Commission. You should be put on murder charges. A metric such as ITF, which I propose today, would have given the teeth for the election commission to control the rallies. As a policy, once you are aware of this, then it gives the teeth for the election rally, uh, for the election commission to say, I will be very serious about it because I know what is coming. And in case they had not taken the action, ITF would have given the grounds to try the election commission. Yes, this is what. Right now, we, we cannot blame any of them because there was no metric, there was no way of making a reasonably accurate computation. So behavioral economics has great potential to steer policy. And uh, in a general sense, we must work towards promoting the subject of behavioral economics and in a more specific, we must promote metrics in such crucial areas such as computing the expected transmissions that have taken place in an event, extends to a product, a service. Yes, aircrafts are produced. There have been people who have got infected. So there is a cost and like how the carbon footprint is measured to see what is not seen, a future environmental disaster. We measure, we pay a higher price to know clean energy and pay for it, to produce cleaner energy. 
we in other areas in in uh, when you consume food from a supermarket you buy in order to know what is coming in order to prevent obesity you are told what is the calories that are there what is the fat content in a ground yes the human nature is not to have see what is not there but if we see it we can steer policy towards better decisions thank you and thanks for your attention my email is there in case uh, people have more queries most welcome to uh, open a dialogue and uh, take this forward as well thank you uh, jacka that's been an excellent very insightful and uh, extremely informative uh, i'm sure there would be a lot of questions uh, uh, from uh, the audience so let me first open up to the audience and uh, uh, anyone who wants to raise a question now what are sir yeah jayaka uh i mean it's an eye opener for me yeah because i never thought of uh, mathematical modeling of uh, uh, all this is total uh, eye opener uh, having said that you no know, we are talking of our election rallies and we talk of our kumbh mela and everything the world also is aware of this kind of uh, modeling okay how come despite the this kind of uh, knowledge there is so much of opposition to uh, protection and prevention yeah especially in the uh, uh, more advanced countries the, the 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 fact that they want to have their right over um, exercising their choice of how they do um one of the figures i presented at the at the point of beginning introducing behavioral economics is cas sunstein now he was he had a white house appointment during the obama regime a harvard professor uh, he has given a written a book called risk and reason and in that he brings about the meaningfulness of actually using all this but the and uh, the idea of nudging that yes they will have to take it we won't impose on the individual but help them to see it and another recent research which he has done about 3 4 years back what and uh, he has he talks about people prefer system 2 nudges to system 1 nudge that means a nudge Uh, uh uh say automatically making an enrollment is a system one nudge where you appeal to the emotion and the general habit of the person that okay i will go by the status quo if the form says yes tick tick it rather than okay if i need to change my pf contribution i will have to say no and then put in my new pf contribution etc is a uh, um, so whereas if the system too much is explained to people what will happen it's a long drawn process and people prefer that but also it is seen that it doesn't really work except so it, it takes a lot of time to seriously understand i'm sure for, for instance to to understand the consequence of what happens after an election rally one would have to sit down and go through the numbers and then and uh, man by nature is more a system one person rather than a system two person the the emotions uh, because system two thinking is all the thinking that calls for effort and system one thinking is emotional it it uh, puts on only the uh, an impression not the computation uh, just like how in the bat and ball problem people apply their system one thinking and then come to the answer that it costs only 10 rupees uh, while they are capable of doing system two but in order to draw that requires a lot of time and effort 
but yeah jack i had an observation your talk was very interesting insightful and it very clearly suggests that we all should avoid crowds to the extent possible my observation is that my limited to experiences with uh, service providers one was with uh, tata aig uh, when i took my travel insurance they gave me so called uh, insurance schedule number which i later on realized could not be used to put a you know claim and half the people will not put the claim getting tired about it in fact myself got tired about it later on when i wrote a letter they said no, no this is only a schedule number you require a uh, policy number which they did not give me they did not give me the policy number they did not give me the policy and they had the audacity to say that we provide treatment for teeth which are new they charge me for elderly people all the charges and the teeth filling had come out it the second case was with uh, vodafone okay they, i did not ask for two services star talk which was 49 rupees prime video which cost about 900 rupees so when i complained that i did not ask for this uh, both the applications they said okay we are removing prime video but we cannot remove star talk and they will refuse to talk to me three months happened like this they kept charging me 49 rupees plus the you know interest for not paying the uh, uh, in time after making so many observations reporting to you know uh, highest level in telecom they removed 63 rupees but they still landed up getting 200 rupees from me of course i could have still fought it but there is a point till which a customer can fight so i'm saying that the corporations can employ behavioral economists and they will come out with the policies which will exploit the workers so unfortunately we find that we are generating the knowledge but the knowledge is being used for benefiting the people who can employ the behavioral economists rather than the public these are my quick thoughts and it was terrible i lived with the pain of these services tata aig huge name and they exploit the yeah. customer saying that uh, no uh, they don't give the policy they don't give the schedule after paying 31000 rupees would have fun i have been having the service of 15000 rupees and they refuse to talk to me because you know they, somebody thinks it is 49 rupees but look at the customer base of vodafone 11 crores out of that if they can you know first 1 crore people they have been able to manage 50 crores in fact i wrote to uh, tri saying that this is what is happening there but unfortunately the bureaucracy also does not respond to them so that we find that more knowledge you create more possibly the customers get exploited that's It's a very interesting topic <laughs> for you to further research that's all i will leave it at that Um, yeah. uh, I'll give you some background. There are uh, uh, actually one of the projects which um, behavioral. There is a team in UK called the Behavioral Insights Team (BIT), which was set up by the government, and now it has become a voluntary organization, which is uh, 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 um, which is working around the world, and. one of their main aspects is simplification of procedure including tax filing making all procedures simplified so that there is a proper response a meaningful response uh, even letters which are written now if you look at india the government especially and more so even the private organization i'm surprised about tata aig now our main communication is focused on can i explain that i did not make a mistake i'm not even saying can i uh, make sure that there was no mm, error on my part a person can go to court but that has to shift and that causes a lot of complications in the uh, uh, instead of uh, the the uh, the best behavioral response what you need yes it it, it is a, uh, i think as a country as service providers and as the government serving the people we are at a very 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 uh, 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 low standards we have already accepted very low standards so mm, uh, that benchmark if it has to go up yes uh, uh, definitely behavioral insights can give give a uh, importance that actually brings to the point of uh, government's responsibility in, in both in terms of moral responsibility as well as the accountability 
Uh, so I uh, go along with what Guru Prasad uh, Raghavendran uh, also made a comment. The government would have known, you know, this uh, behavioral economics and the statistics that you've uh, put across, which I, I believe the health department should have been aware. But then the at the same time, uh, the electoral, uh, you know, uh, priorities and the benefits of running through the electioneering campaigns and the politics, the ex political expediency overtakes what is logically evident through the behavioral economic study that we presented. So if you look at Kumela, again, it had a political as well as a religious benefit in terms of accruing to the uh, party concern. And therefore, it lacks and lacks at the peak of the time they're actually congregating in that place. So what do we make of it? That means despite the knowledge that's available that this is the way we should have actually implemented measures to control the pandemic, you actually take an expediency measure to actually take advantage of your political processes at that point of time and take a hit as it happened finally. People were running out of crematoriums and dead bodies are you know, floating in the Ganges. But you say that that will pass and that people will forget. Is that the political process that's happening? And it happens in not in just our country. I, I believe it's happening okay. in other countries as well. Uh, yes, um, uh, if I can add um, Guru Prasad's question that the government would have known. The government will certainly know that this as uh, is going to the spread of infection is going to be more as a consequence of that. But I very much doubt whether they would have known it in more concrete terms as, okay, if this is the period and if an election campaign is held, it is going to result in the death of 40 people. And that may not have been explicit. And uh, as one of the, as, as the, the um, slide which says that, what Daniel Kahneman says, they didn't want more information that might spoil their story. The moment you have a number put and a logically analyzed uh, result as a consequence, that story is not what is wanted. But I'm also not very sure whether any, I could not uh, uncover any literature that had computed in this manner, the infections transmitted, leading and the consequence of that. That uh, independently, yes, it's not new that one knows if one uh, is, uh, 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 is infected, it is going to spread. And to some extent in the numbers also have come. But coupled with that, if so many are infected, this will be the number of deaths. And again, relating it to the probability of a person being infected, probability of a transmission, uh, the, the generation time, the serial interval, and uh, all the basic reproduction number, and how that comes down. And then uh, uh, laying the full links together as a chain has not been, I have not been able to see anywhere that it is done. I may be wrong, but... Uh, well, that's very relevant, of course. Sir. Huh? So, yeah. Uh, there is a question from the YouTube audience, Surendra Kapoor, uh, Jack of you. Why do the projected COVID infection by IIT professors during the third wave are having no correlation with actual? Um, Okay, uh, yes, the, the, the projections have no correlation. Uh, of course, I do not know which specific projection which was uh, 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 indicated. Yes, some of the numbers, we may go wrong in the estimates. That is why one of the things it's always to put the more conservative estimate. Uh, frankly speaking, I would put the number of infectious people ratio to the number infected in, a, in one day, the reported figures as five, but we have taken three. And uh, likewise, it can happen 
uh, one of the uh, uh, articles in Nature, it talks about estimating the number of deaths. Now, in any statistical pro procedure, it won't be far off, but the statistics will also tell us what is the range at which it can happen. Now, the deaths in the whole world, uh, which is about uh, now 5 million, uh, uh, sorry, in the country, which uh, has been estimated, they have used a model uh, where an artificial intelligence model, which uh, considers 100 parameters, including satellite pictures, mm -hmm. the various aspects, and then done uh, and projected. But they know that the range that it gives is about uh, 18 million to as low as uh, 8 million is the range in which it could be. And of course, in because one does not, it's not easy to communicate it, especially in popular journals. One does not want to say that it was 16 million with a confidence interval of 95% confidence interval at 18 and 5% confidence interval at uh, 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 8 million and so on, which doesn't make sense. So they say that it is 18 million, but I'm sure the IIT professor who would have had it would have had a range and it would have, it would probably fall in one of those ranges. Can I make a comment? Yes, uh, yes. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, I think the person was talking about third wave. I think yes. the vaccination has come into play. Mm -hmm. So that could have changed a lot of things. And people are also started to wear masks. Uh, did social distancing, you know, uh, took them more seriously. So that could also have had an effect on various things. That's true, Chandru. And, and also, I suppose the third wave had uh, a lesser, I think, strength as compared to the second wave uh, for a variety of factors. I think uh, probably that could also be a major factor. I read the nature uh, article, and uh, yes, uh, Jacob, what you're saying is right. The uh, range is quite, you know, uh, high. Uh, anyway, I think uh, we can take one last question if anybody wants to ask a question because we already overshot the time. But this has been an extremely interesting, uh, you know, uh, presentation. I have one question. Can I ask? Please, please go ahead, Mr. Please go ahead. Uh, Professor Jaikar, it was a very, very informative and revealing statistics. Uh, my question is, uh, even now, a lot of people talk about herd immunity and individual immunity. And uh, uh, from your study, it is very clear this cannot be factored into. What is your opinion? Uh, herd immunity, actually, the, the, the parameter R, the effective reproduction number, which I was uh, taking, takes into consideration the herd immunity that develops. The, the, the parameter R0 actually comes from population studies and the population growth studies of uh, uh, and genetics, taking into consideration how rabbits multiply and so on. So there, there was no need for taking R, uh, R0 was constant. But uh, when it comes to uh, things like this, R changes, and that is why the effective reproduction number is formally seen in all the research papers. They talk about R0, they also talk about effective reproduction number, and that effective reproduction number is a function of herd immunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is how it comes down, including changes in, in lifestyle, more consciousness of wearing masks and those aspects, all that leads to electric, uh, the, the effective reproduction number. Uh, I don't have a whiteboard to show, but actually if on the x-axis, if you have the number of cases reported in a day, uh, um, uh, sorry, if, uh, on the x-axis, if you have the calendar days, and on the y-axis, you have the number of cases reported. You will have a curve which, which will go over the hump and then come down. At the hump, 
the effective reproduction number is one, although the basic reproduction number would have been five. And actually, when it is low, when the when the number of cases is very low, the effective reproduction number is very high. But the phenomenon is not seen so much because there are only few people infected. You don't come to know of known cases. The seriousness of uh, taking preventive measures will be less. And uh, this, this can be modeled. And uh, yeah, yeah, many people have worked out the effective reproduction numbers based on which I have put the figures of 3 to 1.5 and so on, which we saw, which has been coming down in the, in the, in the table of how the number of people keeps increasing. Thank you so much. Thank you. That helped. So may I, sir? May I, sir? A yeah, Nila. Very small Nila. one, rather. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Jayakar. So uh, it was very, very insightful, I would say. And I would like to um, inquire about uh, the behavioralism of parents when it comes to uh, their wards being sent to school now that schools have been reopened. But yet we find, you know, not many children going or attending the schools. They have taken up the hybrid variety. So what's your take on that? Um, frankly speaking, I must say that uh, although the uh, statistics and mathematics I have applied on, uh, uh, on this corona, uh, I am really not an expert on that. But I will offer my views as to uh, how serious it is. It's, it's a question of compromise. Um, the, the Cass Sunstein, whom I talked about, he focuses on, on the public, the, um, the computing the general good versus the risk of uh, an, an infection. So, so basically a decision making, weighing the benefit and cost and in terms of the risk. So from that point of view and the currently the Omicron not being very lethal and uh, seeing that uh, the number of deaths and seriousness has been very, very low. And yet there is a big benefit when children go to school, their social development, uh, their uh, ability to interact with people has a tremendous effect. And that is why if you use a mathematical model to value, okay, this is what is exactly happening. And uh, one can uh, make more judicious decisions. But personally, I would, at, even at this time, I would encourage children to go to school. And um, my own grandson would probably be going in the coming week for the first day uh, after this. Uh, so I I'm happy about it. Uh, uh, looking at the cost, I wouldn't have been so happy at a time when the, the infection was raging. So, uh, so it's a question of how, how it would pan out. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, that's, uh, that's an excellent uh, session we've had. Uh, this is a subject I think can go on forever, but all, all good things have to come to an end. Uh, but this, this is also, a, you know, I would uh, encourage uh, Dr. Jacob to continue further, you know, uh, develop a series of studies on this. Probably it could make a wealth of difference towards policy making and uh, could be a good recommendation to the government. We look at that from our own side. Uh, uh, Jacob, thank you very much for this very insightful and excellent uh, you know, presentation. Well, I, I enjoyed as much as everybody I'm sure would have enjoyed this uh, Understanding, and you know, it's more than just listening. I think you brought in a great understanding to each of us. Thank you so much for this uh, fabulous lecture. And on behalf of the Tinan Peninsula Foundation, I, uh, you know, uh, thank you uh, once again, and we will have you with us in the future as well. Uh, now let me now hand over to Madhuvanti to propose the word of thanks. Madhuvanti, all yours. Yes. Uh, on behalf of PF, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Jaikar Vedamarakam for sharing his important work and thoughts with us. 
it was a much needed and an enlightening lecture to prepare ourselves to be mindful of the consequences of even one person getting infected. I also like to thank the Air Marshal for moderating the session today and participants for their attendance and interest in our event. And I hope to see you all at another interesting discussion soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jagger, think... great talk. Uh, Chandru, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great talk, Jagger. Thank you, Chandru. Yeah. Thank you, Chandru. Vatasa, thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thanks, Jaikar. Very nice. Jaikar, thank, thank you. you. It's been a great uh, 